Today is February 3rd of 2017 and I am interviewing Joseph Harvey in Taylorville, Illinois. Um, Joseph is 54 years old having been born on November 22nd, 1963. My name is Sue Burkholder and I will be the interviewer. And um, Joseph, for the recording, would you please state in what war and branch of service that you served? I served during peacetime in the uh, United States Army. Okay. All right. Well, to start with, um, would you please tell us a little bit about where you were born, your parents, your siblings, and a little bit about growing up and leading up to when you went into the Army? Sure. Uh, I was born outside of Chicago, uh, near, uh, if you're not familiar with the city of Chicago, it's mm -hmm. Hoffman Estate, Schaumburg, mm -hmm. northwest suburb. Uh, at that time, uh, it was a really small town, and, uh, well, my parents were Joyce and Joseph Harvey. I'm a junior. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my father, biological father, passed away uh, violently when I was uh, 11 years old and that's what afforded my mom to move further away from the city mm -hmm. because of the violence. Unfortunately, it still happens today, but uh, uh, she remarried to uh, James Howard who raised me as if I was his own child. And uh, I went to Hoffman Estates High School, which uh, at the time was a, a really nice high school, and um, graduated from high school and had a good relationship with my uncles who happened to be Vietnam veterans. And I mean, I really looked up to those guys. I remember when they, I was small when they came back in 75 after the war and um, really loved them and had a strong admiration with them. When I saw them in those suits, you know, in their class age, I was like, wow, you know, that's something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want, I aspired to, you know, for sports, but in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be a soldier. So um, I ended up enlisting. I enlisted uh, in Aurora, Illinois, which is not far from us, but uh, I swore in downtown Chicago. Uh, subsequently, uh, the recruiter, uh, I wanted to go in the Marine Corps initially. Was one of my uncles was a Marine, the other was a, was a soldier. And uh, the timing wasn't right. It was gonna take me maybe eight or nine months in order to, to get into Marine, to, to, uh, to go to uh, boot camp. Uh, but the uh, Army recruiter said, hey, I can get you right away, and I can get you a bonus. I was like, what do you mean by a bonus? He said, uh, $5,000. I said, where do I sign up? <laughs> so, yeah, so before I knew it, uh, I'd signed up, and I was ready to go, and I didn't know what the MOS was. So I called one of my uncles. I said, hey, he said my MOS was 19 Echo. And he says, oh, he said, you're gonna be a tanker. I was like, wow. I was, I was fascinated. So I ended up going to uh, basic training, which was in Kentucky, Fort Knox, mm -hmm. where the Bullion Building is. This place was phenomenal. I mean, the bus ride was, uh, was awesome from Illinois to Kentucky because we took a bus and I mean really I was I, I was kind of overwhelmed because I didn't know what to expect I I heard stories about basic and AIT you know but I I, I was a, a good athlete so the uh, as far as being the regiment wasn't going to bother me, the physical regiment I wasn't concerned with that it was just being overwhelmed coming from a small town you know, people they see you signed up, you're from Chicago. They think, oh, you're from a big town. No, I'm from actually a smaller town outside of Chicago. But I carry Chicago uh, as a brand. Now, that being said, so I ended up in Kentucky, Fort Knox. It's a huge base, uh, this monumental base, you know, Bullion Building. You know, it's got all the stories about, George, about General Patton and all the, the generals who came before. Uh, that being said, Ended up in basic training. I actually flew through basic training. I excelled because I enjoyed it. You know, the PT was was easy for me because I was an athlete. I was a wrestler, played football. 
So it was easy for me. Uh, the academics, you know, were challenging, but once I finished uh, with what was basic training, tra I graduated, of course, went to uh, advanced individual training, which is AIT. So now we're learning more about the tanks, the, the workings of the tanks, you know, uh, how the track operates, how the uh, passive rise system works, how the gyros work, you know, understanding a range finder and things of that nature. So this was an advanced tank, not the old M60. We were, M60 we were trained in on in basic. Now in AIT, they were changing over from the older tank to this new M1 tank. And I tell you, that took some work because we were in school most of the time. But just being around this million dollar equipment, multi-million dollar equipment, this huge 54 ton vehicle, 70 millimeter cannons, uh, uh, 50 millimeter coax rounds, you know, it was like, wow, it was a lot to learn. People think that who don't know, you're looking from the outside that, you know, he's just a soldier with his, you know, with the weapon and his job is just to hurt people or that's, that's far from it. There's so much to it, the discipline aspect of it, you know, the, the camaraderie. I mean, I, I, I had friends from that time period, you know, for 20 years later, you know, that, that I still sort of know some of them today. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have that relationship, of course, but, you know, I can think about that time period in my life, and I'm 54 now, and I can't think of that type of experience just being a, you know, a, a, a United States soldier. There was something about that for me. When I, that might have been the most proud moment of my mom when she came to see me graduate and she's passed away. Kind of get emotional. Uh, yeah, my mom passed away. A couple of years ago, suddenly. Excuse me, I'm sorry. But uh, that was a proud moment for her when she was able to come visit and see me uh, down in Fort Knox. And uh, she was really, the look that she had on her face when she saw me walk across and uh, graduate and become a soldier. She, she was really proud because her brothers were soldiers. Now she was able to see her son become a soldier. That was, that was something for her. I really made her proud. Mm -hmm. So I went on from uh, AIT, uh, and I didn't fully understand our orders. Because I, I wanted that 5,000 bucks. I knew we were going to get that for <laughs> enlisting in the combat MOS. That's the job, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. They took every one of us, every soldier who was under what's called the Ultra Vet program, signing bonus. They took us to a huge gymnasium in Fort Knox. And you can see the MP standing around. They actually cut the check right there at a, at a counter. They gave us our check, and then you were able to go to the next counter and cash it in. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. There were MPs everywhere. There had to be 100 soldiers in there who had that bonus. And uh, there was just a line of us, and we got our check. And I said, well, what am I going to do with this money? I wasn't too business savvy. You think about it, you know, I was a young kid, 18 years old, soldier now, when I got this money. Honestly, I end up spending a lot of money on a vehicle to get to my duty station, which was at uh, California. Uh, I was TDY, temporary duty to Fort Hunter Liggett, but my actual duty station was Fort Orr, uh, which is, of course, closed now. But that place was huge, just as big. You're talking about tanks, helicopters. I mean, there was something, the, the Apache helicopter, it was Cobras. I mean, uh, and it was an active base. I mean, you talk about spit and polish base versus Fort Knox. Fort Knox is like uh, something that you could never put your finger on when you talk about Early in the morning, you hear Reveille, you know, every vehicle stops, no matter who they are, you know, to pay homage to Reveille. So when you go from that to a working base like Fort Ord, it was a little more like Hollywood, what I would call it. But that be what it may, I, I wasn't going to be there long. I was temporary duty to Fort Hunter and Liggett, 
which was in a terrible place. <laughs> it was not like Fort Orr. You're out in the field all day. It's, 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 uh, Fort Hunter Liggett is actually in like central California, but in the, what they call the high desert. Oh my goodness, the terrain is terrible. But the only good thing for me, like I said, I just love being a soldier. I love being around the, 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 the camaraderie, the armor. There was something about the night fire. I'll never forget uh, in basic training, in AIT, night fire was like, you know, night fire was, you know, uh, night, night fire activity, you know, shooting that main gun, the 70 millimeter. When that cannon went off in that tank, the whole tank would rock. And I, the fir I remember the first time I experienced that, it was something that was, <laughs> you can't put your finger on it. When you feel that type of power, it shoots through your whole body. And we had a, 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 a drill instructor at the time. He had stories. And he would always tell you, you know, hey, you know, make sure when you're loading that thing, you keep your arm out of the way or cut your arm off. So I didn't need that type of thing in my head, you know, I mean, oh my God. Or, or make sure you, that when you're, when you're relaxing, don't just fall asleep around the track because, hey, these things will roll and kill you. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to be aware of all of these things. So I wasn't paranoid. I was so young, I wasn't afraid at all. Um, but, and, but, but I was an expert at sighting, at good vision. So I always wanted to be a gunner on the tank. The gunner is the guy who sights the target. You know, so I still remember my, 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 my uh, gunner's command. Gunner, say about tank, you're, you're saying, say about that's the type of round. You're telling the, 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 the actual shooter of the gun that, 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 that you see the tank and you're sighting on the tank. And you're telling him up on the way and he, that when you hear that round go down, <laughs> go down range, you know it's done its business. It's over with. There was something about uh, the uh, American armor. I, I, I was able to study T-62, different tanks, uh, uh, Russian tanks, uh, German tanks. They were, they, they, they were far, far beneath uh, our firepower. When, when you talk about a range down, a uh, weapon down range, you talk about speed, you talk about expertise, everybody on that tank was by the numbers, extremely quick. The driver, the gunner, your tank commander, even the loader. The loader had to know. He had to be quick with his, with, his, with, his, with his rounds. He couldn't fumble. He had to know what round because it was life or death. And that's one thing our drill instructor uh, in AIT drilled into us. He said, well, every time you do something, think of it as if your life depended on that person. Don't look at it as if you're just getting through school here. Look at it as these guys that you're training with. If they called us today, this is the crew you're going to go with. And that transformed everything. Because at that time, the Cold War was still ex in existence. Ronald Reagan was our president. The Beirut situation had taken place. And I was like, oh my God, we can go in any minute. So it changed my process. It became more than money for a uh, benefit of the five thousand dollars, it came. It, it was it meant greater to me than school money, because you know, in the back of your mind, hey, I'm going to get school money. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm 18 years old, mm -hmm. so that changed that my my thought process. At AIT, I know, okay, I'm this is life or death. Mm -hmm. So when he tells me that I have to keep the, my weapon clean, I have to know how to break my 50 caliber down. It wasn't just knowing how to do it; it meant life or death. Drill Sergeant Johnson, I'll never forget him. Said, There's things you'll never forget about the military. I remember my drill, drill instructor. We, we were able to run in boots if we wanted to, but they, they allowed us to, to uh, run distance PT in gym, gym shoes at that time because there were so many guys who had uh, fallen arches from boots. Drill instructor Johnson never did it. He ran in combat boots, the old ones from, <laughs> from Vietnam. <laughs> Every day, and he did everything we did, and he was always spit and polished, meaning that his his gear was always squared away. No matter what he did, I never saw him out of uniform. And I said, wow. And I'll never forget, he never called me by my real name. I won't say what they called us on camera. But, you know, you know how they do. It was a thing where they, 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 was, they weren't trying to demean you. They were trying to build you up, tear you down. So uh, my drill sergeant would call us, you know, of course the maggots and 
different little things, but he never called me by my name until I graduated. I, I thought my name might have been Maggot for a while. <laughs> but when I graduated and he took the picture with myself and my mom mm -hmm. and, my, and my stepdad, who I consider my father, uh, he says, uh, Private Harvey, good luck. I was like, oh my God, well, I got my name back. Mm -hmm. So that was a, that was my uh, uh, my reckoning and my transition. I know, okay, I'm a soldier now. So I'll never forget that. And it allowed me, like I said, to, to take the military serious. It's, it's a beautiful experience. I'll never forget it. Uh, I loved it. Uh, my, my first child was born while I was in. I'll never forget that. I was out in the field and uh, got a phone call. <laughs> my, my son was born in a place called Templeton, California. Beautiful place. I didn't know uh, about the, uh, I had insurance, of course, but I wasn't sure how it went. But someone said, oh, it's only like, maybe like five bucks, you know, because you got campus insurance, yada, yada, because I, I, I filled out all the paperwork. So there was a difficulty with the pregnancy, and there had to be a C-section. My son, Jero, that's his name, and uh, he, uh, I got a separate opinion from another doctor. And I'm not knowing that every time you talk to a doctor, that's more money. So I wasn't sure. When I got that bill, it was uh, like uh, $14,000 because there was a cesarean section. I talked to different doctors, two different doctors saw her, you know, and, it, and maybe they knew about the money. I didn't know I was a kid. Long story short, she didn't know either. My wife was Amber. And um, long story short, he was born. But I remember I said, wow, had, had I not been in the military, I would have to pay that bill. You know, so long story short, I took that bill, gave it to the uh, people, what they call PAC. They took care of everything. And the lady said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. I was like, wow, $5. So I said, Uncle Sam really takes care of his people. You know, they really do. They really take care of us. They really do. So. Uh, myself, like I said, I'm big on this uh, this, uh, this uh, patriotism. Always have been, always will be. Uh, I love America. Uh, when you think about my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Uh, that that takes hold of you if you really listen to the words. Land where my father died. Uh, land of the pilgrims' pride. Uh, uh, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. That, at, not just as a soldier, but as an African American who happened to be a soldier, it meant a lot to me. And when I see uh, young people today who don't take uh, service, patriotism serious, it, it, I can understand some of the wartime veterans, how they feel, you know, when uh, when they see certain things, desecration of the flag, um, uh, no honor, no patriotism, no sacrifice, because somebody sacrificed for us to be where we're at, you know, someone sacrificed for someone to be able to have the First Amendment right, the Third and or Fourth Amendment right, even the Second Amendment, you know, the right to bear arms in itself. Someone sacrificed, someone died for those liberties that we have. Uh, I really uh, see us in a different place in time, but uh, patriotism and service is something that I believe young people really need because that shaped me, uh, my, that shaped my thought process that shaped my understanding about, you know, this country and of itself. The Constitution, I, 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 my civics courses in school uh, paled in comparison to what I learned at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Oh, because we had, of course, uh, when, when, when most people look at service members, they just think it's all, you know, boots and boots and guns. They don't know. No, you, you're in school. I, I had a civics course while I was in AIT, they wanted us to understand not just uh, our constitution, but different relationships with other countries. If you're gonna be deployed to certain places, they want you to understand customs. So my experience, I mean, as, as uh, 
uh, academic experience in uh, the military, oh my God, I can't put, I can't put a value on it because it opened my eyes up to different cultures. I would have never understood uh, the Greco-Roman Empire, uh, the Middle East, we were talking about Persian, the Persian Gulf area. I wouldn't have cared about it, probably, because, you know, if it didn't relate to me, but they were preparing us if we ever had to be deployed to those places to understand different cultures, knowing that a lot of us were young guys from inner cities who may have not had those understandings coming up in school and they gave it to us. So, you know, I know I've talked to, I've talked a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. No, um, one thought that, or one question that came to mind was um, when you finished AIT mm -hmm. and you went into your, your service, mm -hmm. what, tell me what a day in the life of your service. You've told us a little bit mm -hmm. that, you know, you get up in the morning and, oh, and, yeah. and how does that work? Oh, well, actually, uh, I'm currently married to a, my uh, my wife Sheila, but at the time our first wife was uh, Amber, and we actually lived off post, mm -hmm. right? So once I got to my permanent duty station, it actually was like a job, a regular job. I, of course, I was a soldier. I was still a tanker, so I would get up in the morning, of course, uh, early in the morning because we had to drive from when I was at Fort Hunter Liggett, the drive to, uh, from Paso Robles is the town I ended up living in. I didn't live on post, because Fort Hunter Liggett was so small, the only on post housing was for officers. Of course, I was an NCO. So I, I, I got a, uh, an apartment, which was, I want to say at the time, was about maybe 350 bucks a month. You know, it was a, from a small town called Paso Robles. So I would end up driving maybe 50 miles a day. So now nah, I didn't do it, I wouldn't do it every day, so I wasn't supposed to do it, but I would stay at the base a lot, you know, just sleep up, sleep on, sleep at, I'd, I'd get a spot in the barracks, and it was just a bed to sleep, you know, it was clean with the fellas, you know, who weren't married, you know, and they loved my company, <laughs> because I used to sing a little bit for them. But anyway, um, we drive uh, from, uh, Paso Robles to uh, hold on to get to Fort uh, Hunter Liggett. Uh, sometimes I would eat breakfast in the mess hall with, with, the, uh, with my other brothers, the other soldiers. Uh, then we'd have to make mustard, of course, which was interesting. You know, when you have to fall in as a unit, you know, it's like, it's like a uh, mustard is like an accountability of all the soldiers. And uh, from that, we'd start our day off. Now, a lot of times, at a, post like Fort Hunter Liggett, you're in the field. So you, 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 you leave from, your, the, uh, from the barracks and you would go out to the field. So a lot of times we would uh, take a, like a cattle car. We'd all be, it was not a nice bus for us. It would be like a real cattle car. And we'd all load up in the cattle car and head off to the field, which may be, you know, a couple of miles in. And it was, the terrain was rugged. The terrain and at, at uh, Fort Hunter Liggett kind of like mimicked uh, what we would call uh, a, uh, uh, not a jungle type, but a, a combination of, of dry desert slash jungle. You know, you had you had some uh, vegetation, so they wanted to simulate it that area to make it seem like uh, we would say Panama maybe or uh, Grenada maybe, those, because a lot of those issues, those conflicts was going on at that time. So a long story short, so we go out to the field, we're out there with our tanks. Uh, a lot of times we would just, you know, drive, drive around, uh, do different exercises. At the time they, were, they had a thing called, a program called Hellfire, which was the, uh, the Apache choppers. So they would put sensors on our tanks and they, what they were doing was getting the, the Apache ready for combat, so they would, for us, they would just uh, have us rev the engine up, and the Apache would come up over a, over a hillside and determine the uh, heat from our tank. They'd have us rev the engine up, mm -hmm. and they would let us know if they detected it, and they would go back down. We might do this for three or four days at a time, where we're just sitting out in the field, rev the engine up, okay, 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 let it cool down. They would see if they can find us, and we would move to different areas, you know, and. and different, uh, we would uh, basically camouflage the tank 
and they would see if the, if the, if the chopper can locate us. And then we would do the same thing, you know, we would, they had the, the, uh, what they called the VIND, VIND, V-I-N-D system on our track. And that was to, de to determine if we can uh, seek out uh, a tank from the heat of, uh, of another tank or another chopper. Because tanks are usually anti-personnel or tank killers. You know, we're not, we, 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 we travel in a bounty, what they call overwatch group. So it's like, almost like a destroyer group in the ocean, the Navy. The people, they see a, an aircraft carrier, it's not by itself. There's a, there's a destroyers with it, there's subs are with it in the same area. Right. They travel. It's the same thing with, tank, with armor. We travel with, with, with the CAV. So we've got choppers with us, several tanks, all in the unit, and there's no telling what else. And that's beyond my pay grade. But there's a lot of stuff going on out there. We're not by ourselves. So we would do this in unison with the uh, with, uh, choppers, which they call air cab. And this was something that we just did every day, uh, uh, sighting our tank, making sure that it was what we would call combat ready. Mm -hmm. So we, we did a lot of live fire. Once I, be, once I got to my, my regular duty, I mean, it, was, it wasn't simulated fire. We used live fire, just to get as if it was happening today. So we were prepared, you know, working with the 50 cal. So as a combat soldier, it's, and when you think about a job, when I say it's a job, it's not like I was going to do any other job but that job. And, and uh, uh, our company commander said, hey, it's a killing machine and you're in the killing business. And that's all you have to do. And that was it. He said, I want you to every day know this machine, know what it'll do, know how fast it'll go, know how to, if, if a track breaks down, know how to repair a track. And we would simulate, we would go out and throw a track, you know, and then repair the track. We would go out and, and uh, at nighttime with our night vision and, and fire, and we would, they would have targets set up in different places that were difficult places, different ranges, and we would have to seek those targets out. So th there was, they would create smoke, they would create dust in the area, and you would have to, they would simulate situations. And this is what my job was every day. The, uh, it wasn't like I had a job, 19 Echo as an armored, uh, it wasn't like a, a transportation or those other places where they can go sit and, yeah, you know, I mean, maybe just kill some time. No, nah, as an armored tanker, one thing I can attest to, armor, you are a combat soldier. Your job is to train to take out the enemy every day. And, and I can see why we have such an expert, outstanding military. Because like I said, when I saw 10 tanks lined up, live fire at night, what they call night fire, mm -hmm. and with nothing. That was just, uh, uh, I would never want to be on the other end of that. I, I feel sorry for anybody who has to stand up to that type of firepower. And I said, I thank God I'm an armored soldier <laughs> every day. Yes, thank God, yeah, because I, I, I would never want to be on the other end, other end of that artillery, no. No. And I loved it. I, as a soldier, I just, I just loved it. And this is one of the greatest experiences of my life okay. for me. Um, just tell us a little bit about um, the, uh, what did you do for entertainment and mm. some of those basic oh. little things, how the food was, those type of things. Oh, well, you know what? Actually, the food for me, I, I enjoyed it, you know. The only thing I, I didn't enjoy was sometimes to see what they call the C rations. They call them MREs now, but there were C rations at the time. And uh, I, me being kind of a mama's boy, <laughs> I, I missed the breakfast and stuff like that, the scrambled eggs. But if you were on post, oh, the, the food was phenomenal because of them. I think that was because of the amount of civilians that were on post, you know, and, and, and me eating at what's called the mess hall mm -hmm. uh, wasn't bad. No, because you had good scrambled eggs. You had, you know, the uh, uh, in the morning they had the they called it uh, biscuits and gravy. We called them something else. I'm trying to keep my vernacular right, uh, but <laughs> we called it something else. But it was uh, 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 gravy and uh, toast, uh, eggs almost every other morning, uh, over easy eggs. So, so there was a misconception. Like I said, if you're assigned to a particular post, 
you're going to eat pretty decent. Even now, even out in the field, they would they, sometimes they would bring out, uh, uh, you know, regular hot meals at least once or twice a day. Mm -hmm. They would, yeah. So the food wasn't that bad, you know. For me, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, at first, it was like, ah, you know, but you get used to it. You know, it could be worse. But uh, a lot of guys complain, you know, uh, I guess they're the spoiled guys, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, but the, uh, the armor creates a certain type of soldier. You can't be, you know, a, a prima donna. You got to get used to certain things fast because think about it. You, you're in that tank sometimes with these three other guys. A long period of time, you're in there every day. Sometimes the hatch is closed, and you're in there. You, you know, and, you, and if they say there's a, a chemical uh, environment, they'll simulate that, and they'll say you have to stay in there all, in the tank all day. So you you have to use you have to relieve yourself. There's a lot of things that go on, so you become real close. So you you gotta have thick skin and get over stuff fast. And that that meal that you are you accustomed to, yeah, you'll drop that pretty quick. Now, entertainment, oh, there was all kind of entertainment. Funniest thing. I don't know if I could tell the story, but I'll shoot it. You can edit it if you want to. <laughs> you know, we were in the tank a lot. I'll never forget there was a guy who was, uh, he was a Mexican guy, uh, Juan. Now, he was, of course, he was born here, but his people were from Mexico. He, and his English wasn't as good as it should have been, but he was a good soldier. And uh, he, uh, he didn't know how to, a play shoot what do you call it shoot dice you know play dice mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of city guys who were from up north you know we all did that so when we got paid we'd have all our money you know when you got you know, here's all these 18 19 20 years old you know we don't have too many responsibilities I'm the only guy who just had a child but uh, a lot of us didn't have children so they had no responsibility every week I mean every month or twice they got paid twice a month uh, they'd have these checks and sometimes we'd end up sitting out in the field we're in the tank with nothing to do you know we're just waiting on you know, some an order to come down or maintaining the track you know keeping them I refer to track that's a tank mm -hmm. keeping it clean upkeep on so there's only so much upkeep you can do on your weapons so sometimes we just, we, we're in the tanks just hanging out you know for you know a couple hours so here we go playing cards or shooting dice or there was a guy who didn't really know how to shoot dice the, uh, the guy I was telling you, the Hispanic guy. Oh my goodness! Oh, <laughs> he took. He, he had to part with his funds. <laughs> but when you think back on, ah, it was terrible. I mean, we didn't break him, break him. But he, he wanted to learn. He said, "Hey, I want to know how to gamble," because he wanted something to do. But yeah, we ended up uh, you know, doing a little gambling. You know, we're, we're, we're all brothers. We wouldn't break each other if, if, because you know what the camaraderie was was like for us. If another brother needed something. He, it was there. When my son was born, uh, uh, I'll never forget, uh, they all came. There was like five of, of uh, my brothers from uh, my platoon came and stayed at our house over the weekend because we had weekends off, believe it or not. Some days we didn't have to show up <laughs> on the weekends. So came on the weekend and uh, stayed with us. We had a, the place we were living was really small. I'd say uh, it was a one, no, it was one and a half, one and a half bath. So it's a small house, but we, we were used to staying together anyway in a tight area. So they all put made little pallets on the floor, and they stayed. And my wife cooked for us, and uh, we sat, played cards. You know, that was I mean that was a big thing for us to do, just hang out and play cards. Uh, sometimes we'd sing songs out in the field. When we out in the field, we'd sing songs, and that was a, that was a big thing for us, just to, just to really hang out. You know, cards was a big thing. Uh, some of us played chess. Some of us played checkers. I was a big board game type guy, but but uh, we would go out sometimes, go to a movie, enjoy a movie. But uh, like I say, by by a lot of those guys being so far from home, you know, uh, they would find a guy like myself who lived off post, and that would be their second home away from you know all the hustle and bustle of the of the barracks. You know, they figure they can come, you know, have an ironing board. You know, they can go swimming, mm -hmm. things of that nature. You know, and and. Uh, a, a good hot meal, you know, that they wanted to cook, you know, uh, breakfast, lunch, or dinner on the weekends like this. We did, often we would have, uh, the company commander would give us, we'd say, well, don't come tomorrow, you got tomorrow off, you know, or you get Saturday or Sunday off. Yeah, so we did get, that, that's, that may be the only part that was close to civilian life. <laughs> but other than that, yeah.
All right. Well, so how long were you in the military? Uh, about two years. Okay. Yeah. So how did it come? I mean, when you were ready to get out, how did that happen? And, and what did you do immediately after? Well, I, I just in time serves. I actually was. I actually got hurt, but that's another story. Uh, I ended up going back to the area that I was from, the, the uh, Hoffman Estates area, and uh, the transition for jobs. Okay, I did some basement repair work. You know, to be honest, but that's the only thing about it that I can say. The advice that I would give to a soldier is to to really, really focus on alternative academics. I mean, if your MOS is 19 Bravo or 19 Echo, uh, you're, you're, you're a soldier. And that doesn't really transfer into society when it comes to, you know, who's gonna drive a tank? You know, what are you gonna do with that? Maybe get you a CDL or something, you know, but the thing is you have to really be able to transfer something, especially today, something that's technical, you know. Uh, in the computer field or whatever, something that's going to allow you to take what you've been doing and transfer it. So all them, a lot of MOSs do not transfer well, and mine really didn't. No, but I did. Like I, I, I was able to get specific jobs, and I did okay. You know, but uh, could have been better for me. Decisions and choices. I know you talked a little bit earlier. You. Um, uh, in the middle of the interview, you talked a little bit about um, uh, just giving some thoughts. But just to kind of wrap up, what mm -hmm. what would you say to um, anybody, like future generations, who mm -hmm. might see or hear this interview? What would you say to them? Wow. I would say that this generation, or the generation that I came up in, uh, we had a lot, we benefited from the generations of the 50s, those young boys who uh, uh, were involved in Pearl Harbor, the young guys who uh, from D-Day, you're talking about Omaha Beach, I'll never forget learning about uh, men who stormed the beach with no way to escape. You know, uh, you're dropped off on the beachhead and you look back and the boat's leaving you there. You have to, and they're telling you to take the beach and there's Constantine wire and you're taking, you're taking fire. I can imagine that type of sacrifice for them but if we're speaking about a future generation, think about the sacrifice of people that came before you and know that you're standing on somebody's shoulder. I mean, Vietnam may have not have been a uh, glamorous war, and the war never is. But we talk about uh, our, our country dispelling communism, our, our country fighting to, to liberate other countries. Uh, we talk about France, we talk about Normandy. There was people who sacrificed. So for future generations, what will you sacrifice for freedom, mm -hmm. for liberty, you know, so that someone can come after you and enjoy this great land that we call the United States of America? I mean, we talk about American exceptionalism, will, will, will it always be that? You know, and remember that someone sacrificed before you. When I, when I think about those young men who gave their life and said, hey, you know what, I'm going, I'm going. Even after 9-11, uh, there was a substantial amount of young people who signed up, said, I'm going, because of, I think that's, that's, that's monumental. There's, a, there, there's, a, there's a, a power in that when a young person says, hey, I'll sign that document. I'll, I'll, I'll give my life for this country. That's a lot. And, and I'm, I'm not sure if the future generation, you know, uh, they're so technologically caught up in the things. They're, they're so sanitized that we're so separate from 
understanding conflicts and understanding the joy that we have, that, we, that we're allowed to enjoy in freedom, the things that we have, that somebody laid down their life for that. And like you said, my, for the future generation, if, if they're listening and watching this, you know, ask yourself, you know, what will you sacrifice? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate taking the time to, to tell your story and to talk with me today. And um, mm -hmm. thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for allowing me to tell my story. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm.